Welcome to the iPad Podcast, a weekly podcast from Mac's Future. Okay, welcome to episode 72 of the iPad Podcast. This is Lex at MaxFuture.com, and this is a podcast about iPad related news, iPad apps, and iPad gadgets. This is a chit chat free podcast. So let's get to it. Okay, so I guess one of the big pieces of news this week is we're getting closer to the launch of iOS 5, which is going to be the next operating system for the iPad. And Apple is releasing uh, new iterations of Lion and the uh, iOS 5 beta for developers. And Apple Insider had a nice story out on, uh, geez, let's see, earlier this week, um, basically pointing out that Apple issues new iCloud-equipped build of macOS 10.7.2 to developers. And basically, this build has iCloud-related stuff in it. It basically says that the latest version is set to include iCloud in the installer, Previously, developers had to download and install iCloud separately for testing. And it also basically said that Alex, uh, I, uh, Apple is beginning to transition user accounts from mobile media to iCloud this past weekend and also allows developers to transfer mail, contacts, and calendars to the new iCloud.com site. So we're getting closer to it. The current version of iCloud also includes the address book, iCal, Mail, MobileMe, and Safari is being integrated into iCloud. So this is exciting. And, uh, you know, what iCloud is, it's, you know, Apple getting rid of MobileMe, which was its web-based service, where you could sync Macs with other Macs, and you could also use Find My iPhone uh, to find your iPad and your iPhone and now your Mac. And basically, iCloud's going to be really uh, a big step up in terms of internet services from Apple. I mean, the big thing is that apps that are iCloud enabled are going to be able to sync using iCloud, even third-party apps, to the iPad and to uh, iPhone. I mean, right now, the best syncing on the iPad is through the cloud service Dropbox, and there's a lot of apps on the iPad that work with Dropbox on the iPad and Dropbox on the Mac. And so, for example, I have this great app called 1Password on my Mac, and there's 1Password on the iPad and the iPhone. And 1Password basically stores all your passwords, and you can have it save the database to Dropbox, and then it will be synced that database to your 1Password app on your iPad. So if you create a new password and store it in 1Password on your iPad, it's boom, it's there for on your Mac. So iCloud is essentially going to steal a lot of Dropbox's thunder, and iCloud is going to give that ability to use the internet to sync programs from one device to another through iCloud. So that's one major thing with iCloud. There's other things too. For example, there's going to be the match service that Apple uh, is going to have where Apple is going to charge you something like, I don't know, 25 bucks a year. And your Apple's going to then scan your iTunes library. And if it has up to 25,000 songs, uh, if it sees that 25,000 of your songs are songs that Apple has in its store, then Apple's going to give you free versions of of those uh, songs on your iCloud account for you to download to all your devices. So you don't have to really worry about syncing all your music uh, through iTunes on your Mac to your iPad. You're just going to have them available in the cloud. And the beauty is you don't have to upload it. So you know, I think that's going to be a big feature of iOS 5. I mean, it ha- also has other things. iOS 5 is going to allow you to have your iPad be completely independent from the Mac or Windows running iTunes. Uh, so someone can now buy iPad and not have any computer 
when iOS 5 comes out because they'll be able to back up their data and their photos to iCloud. So that's another big part of iCloud. Now some people are, are, are upset about iCloud because Apple is going to be dropping some things in iCloud that were in mobile me. For example, Apple's gallery, which is photo and movie, you know, website where you can upload your fo photos and movies and show them to people, that's not going to be in iCloud. Apple's going to have some sort of automatic backup from your iPhone or iPad of photos and movies. But that sounds a little different than the, the sort of galleries that you've already created. It sounds like they're going to disappear. But there may be good news on the horizon because Apple Insider reports that some people have been contacting um, Apple and they've been, you know, in the past people have contacted Steve Jobs and he's emailed them back. And apparently Tim Cooks has, is reading email and he has contacted at least one reader who, you know, is upset about some of the services that are going to be lost in iCloud. For example, this person wrote specifically, quote, specifically, I bemoaned the loss of sync services, sync, syncing applications, preferences, keychains, etc., and the loss of iDisk, end quote, the reader said of his initial email to Cook. And then he says, I was presently surprised to get a call from his office just now. And, you know, basically Cook's people said, that while there's no plans to add those particular services to iCloud at this time, quote, Apple is open to it if there's enough feedback on the subject. So if enough people complain or write to Apple about missing features in iCloud, like iDisk or Gallery, or for example, iWeb is going to disappear, then Apple may reverse course. So it could be that maybe Steve Jobs I mean, I mean, Tim Cook is more flexible than Steve Jobs when it comes to, um, you know, user feedback and um, changing the company's mind. Now, one listener has submitted some questions to me regarding iCloud, uh, and I'll try to answer them as best as I can. One question is about security. How can we be sure that the iCloud is safe for our data? Um, well, my answer is you can never be safe anywhere with your data, even if you have them at home. You know, somebody breaks into your house and steals your computer. Your data is not necessarily safe. But iCloud, I think, will be safe because Apple's a major company. Apple knows how important security is. And Apple has watched as other companies have had trouble with online security. And Apple's has been, Apple has been running iTunes for years for like you know that's the, been their big hit with the iPod and iTunes is essentially a cloud-based service think about it in iTunes you have your credit card information it's really an online presence that syncs with your app and there's lots of money at stake with iTunes and yet yeah occasionally there's hacks into iTunes but Apple does a good job of policing iTunes and preventing you know people from hijacking your account, so I I don't I mean I don't really have any concerns with iCloud. I mean iCloud is syncing data from your apps, you know, from one device to another. We've already been doing that. Uh, for example, as as the people who are complaining about uh, mobile me's some of features being lost, like the keychain syncing. So think about that, you know, already for a long time with mobile me, um, your keychains that are in your Mac, which have your passwords for different sites, that data is synced through mobile me to other Macs. So that's going through the cloud. Um, you know, similarly, um, wow. Well, I mean, your email goes through the cloud. So, I mean, what I don't understand, I don't think this really much to be worried about. I don't think there's really much to be worried about. I mean, yes, there's always risks, but Apple knows with any online service that it has to protect that data. So I'm not concerned about that. The second question has to do with Apple's Match service that's part of iCloud. And Match is going to basically allow 
match is going to work like this. Basically, you're going to pay Apple, I don't know, 25 bucks a year. And unlike Google Music or Amazon's uh, online music service, you're not going to have to upload all your music to Apple's match service. Apple's doing something unique. Apple is basically going to scan your, your library of iTunes. In other words, it's going to scan. Well, Apple pretty much already knows what's in iTunes on your Mac. If you ever in, enable the genius feature, Apple looks through all your metadata of your music or movies that are on your Mac or Windows iTunes. And that information is sent to Apple. And Apple suggests to you music and movies to buy based on the music that you already have. So Apple, if you agree to this match service, is going to look at your files and see what music you have. And then if Apple has that music, uh, even if it's at a different um, data rate, for example, let's say you downloaded music and it was at 96 kilobytes and Apple has its library 256 kilobytes, Apple is going to make its store version of the music available in your iCloud account, your Match account, and you're not going to have to upload those MP3 files, which is a good thing because a lot of people don't have fast upload speeds with their internet connection. My cable company has fast download speeds of like 30 megabytes per second, but I get, I get really slow upload speeds of like one megabyte per second. If you've ever backed up gigabytes and gigabytes of um, data to one of those backup services like Backblaze, uh, or Mosey, you know what I'm talking about because it takes forever. It took me, I have hundreds of gigabytes of data, mainly photos and music, and it took me weeks to back up all my data to Backblaze. So what Apple's going to do is just sort of scan what you have and say, okay, we, ha we have pretty much everything or most of what you have, and so we're going to make those tracks available uh, online in your iCloud match service and the beauty of that is you don't have to upload it but you'll have it there pretty quickly because Apple has it already up there and Apple doesn't have Apple doesn't have to store multiple copies I mean think about how good this is for Apple because let's say millions of people have a certain Rolling Stones song Apple only has to keep one copy of that Rolling Stones song up in the cloud and you can download it, or the millions of people can download it. Now the question from the listener was, is this service essentially making some illegal music downloads that you have legal? And I guess it is. I mean, there's a lot of people who back in the days of Napster uh, downloaded you know, thousands and thousands of MP3s. And if Apple can recognize the metadata in the song, it will give you a store version of that same song for free online in your Match account. So it, it is, Apple is legitimizing to some extent all the music that you've gotten. If you've ripped CDs from a friend's CD or downloaded from Napster. Now what I think is interesting is... Um, how is Apple going to recognize the metadata? Like, what if I took a song, and in iTunes you go into information, you can, you can change the metadata of a song. So what if I change, you know, the metadata of songs? Let's say I change the metadata of songs to songs that I don't have, but that I want, that are newer songs. Will Apple be fooled? into thinking I have the track and provide it for me. Now, I suspect Apple is looking at more than the metadata. It's probably also looking at the length of your music track. So you would have to change the track actual audio file to be the length of the, you know, the, the, the track of music that you're trying to pretend it is. And, it, and who knows, maybe Apple has 
other means. Maybe they can actually look at the waveform patterns in your MP3 files. Because music, all music has a signature. It's very hard for two songs to have the same waveform um, pattern because the waveform is the music. If you've ever looked at an audio file, there's like a waveform and it, it's like a signature. So maybe Apple is also looking at the waveforms to confirm what the song is. But the bottom line is I do think if you've got sort of songs that you've gotten somewhat Ill illegitimately, I, I believe Apple is going to recognize any music in your library, not only music that you've downloaded from iTunes, but music that you've imported from other means. So yes, it is. it does seem to be legitimizing uh, any music that you may have gotten through some sort of illicit means. So on the other hand, the music companies get some of that revenue that Apple's getting uh, for basically you know, converting your libraries into legitimate libraries. So it's, it's very interesting. Okay, so the big news earlier this week is that Microsoft, Apple's arch enemy, um, released a, a, a beta version of Windows 8, which is the future of its operating system, not only for the PCs, but Windows tablets. And it, and re it released Windows 8 and gave away to developers who attended a conference thousands of, uh, I guess, uh, is it Samsung or Motorola slates? And these are sort of tablet-like devices. So this is big news because I think to some extent um, Microsoft poses much more of a competitive threat to Apple's iPad dominance than Android devices. Now why do I say that? I say that because Microsoft continues to be uh, an 800-pound gorilla in the office space. You know, most enterprise places still use Windows PCs, and a lot of IT departments are all trained on Windows and Microsoft, and they're afraid to try anything else. And so there's probably a lot of IT departments that have been getting pressured by their users uh, to get iPads officially, and they've been resisting it, but they may embrace tablets that run a Microsoft product on it. So here's the weird thing about Windows 8. It, it has the ability to run touch um, iPad-like software, uh, both on a PC and a tablet device. And this version, it's called the Metro style or the Metro view. And it's sort of like Windows 7 on, the, on Windows 7 phones. It has like tiles for apps. And, um, and, but it also can run the regular traditional Windows operating system on a tablet and even run DOS on a tablet as well as on a computer. And let's see, this uh, website, geeky-gadgets.com, has a little video that shows, um, shows the iPad next to a slate running the uh, Windows 8 Metro style. So, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I, it looks a little clunky, but it's in preview mode right now, the, uh, the Windows 8 Metro, which is the um, tablet uh, operating system. Um, but the general principles are the same. It's touch-based. Um, the thing is the iPad operating system is much more efficient right now. Let's see if we can jump ahead in this video. Um, you have like sort of a status indication uh, on the left and instead of like individual apps you've got these big squares which are the which are the tiles and the tiles are sort of you know jumping to different programs or you might have the ability for a tile to send information. Look, it's just a, you know, it's a, it's definitely different, looks different than anything Apple's done. Uh, and it may take off. I mean, I've gotten used to the apps, 
um, little icons and I'm not really used to the, you know the tile uh, it has a keyboard just like the iPad a software keyboard looks a little different um, stylistically uh, so I don't know I mean I haven't played around with it I haven't installed it I don't have a slate um, tablet and we'll have to see what it's like but I do think Microsoft's going to pose the biggest challenge to the iPad. I don't think it's going to be Android because of Microsoft's presence in the enterprise setting. Now recently I got an iPad for my elderly mother and one of my friends recently got an iPad too uh, after his computer was stolen so all he has is an iPad. And I, Hopefully I didn't steer them wrong uh, in getting the iPad too. Cult of Mac suggests We've heard rumors before that who knows maybe there will be an iPad 3 in October and what they're basing it on in this article that came out from John Brownie uh, earlier this week on September 16th is that um, Target the retail company has just declared the iPad 2 to be in its end of life um, as a product um, and I guess this is you know they're they're no longer selling the iPad 2s or soon will not be selling it um, so what does this mean I mean it's you know they're they're basically saying that because the iPad 2 is no longer going to be sold at Target that the iPad 3 must be coming and I don't think there is any way there's going to be an iPad 3 in October uh, Apple you know has huge demand still for the iPad 2 there's hardly any competition and um, the you know Apple all the manufacturing indications are in terms of uh, hardware that the the next generation chip not the a5 but the a6 is hasn't even gone into production yet so I don't know I I, I really doubt that the iPad 3 is coming this fall if you if you had been thinking about getting the iPad 2, I wouldn't hesitate. I would run out and get it now because, you know, the way th look at look what happened with the iPhone uh, 5. Everybody thought the iPhone gets um, updated every year on, you know, in June, and now we're almost into October and the iPhone 4 has not been updated yet to the iPhone 5. Meanwhile, the iPhone 4 is selling like hotcakes. So you don't want to wait a long time for the iPad. Life is too short. If you don't have one and you're thinking about getting one, just get it now. One thing I, I think we will get very soon is uh, more choices on what cell data service we're going to be able to run the iPad. Right now, the iPad 2, you, if you want more than Wi-Fi and you want cell phone data service, you have a choice of Verizon or AT&T. Well, um, CNET.com reports that Sprint is going to get its own iPad 2, according to rep reports. And it gets its information from 9to5Mac, which reported on the 14th of September that Apple and Sprint have completed work on an iPad that is compatible with Sprint's wireless network. And um, also Sprint is going to be carrying the iPhone, supposedly. So, you know, I think this is great. Um, Sprint's network is CDMA, the same technology as Verizon, but I think it's good to have choices. Um, you know, it's it's going to be only all, all, what it's going to do. It's going to just foster more sales of the iPad. The more you know, network it's networks it's on the you know the the more it's going to sell. So, you know, good for Sprint. Okay, so if you like the Flipboard app or the Pulse app on the iPad and th that's the uh, those apps which provide sort of feeds of news and pictures and stuff from your social uh, networks like Twitter or Facebook uh, there's a story out that Google is going to come out with something that competes with Pulse and Flipboard and um, you know the article that I'm looking at is on slashgear.com and in the, the heading of the article is Google Propeller Promises News Revolution for iPad and Honeycomb. Honeycomb is the Android operating system for tablets 
And the article basically says Google is readying a new socially enabled newsreader app, Google Propeller, which will take on well-known rivals like Pulse and Flipboard in addition to challenging Facebook's recent news editions. So it's, the article says Propeller is expected to be available both on Android Honeycomb tablets and Apple's iPad. And the source they have is All Things Digital, which is the Wall Street Journal. Um, and it basically says that the stuff is in the pipeline. Um, so, I mean, look, Google gets into everything and Google competes with everything. You know, uh, Google couldn't buy Groupon, so it created a Groupon rival. Uh, Google couldn't, you know, come to good terms with Facebook about tapping into Facebook's data. So Google has now created Google+. Plus. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this propeller service is an HTML5 app. In other words, it's a web app that's optimized for the iPad and Honeycomb. So, you know, on one hand, I'm thrilled that there's, you know, more choices for the iPad. On the other hand, you know, Google seems to get its tentacles into everything and you know, uh, how dominant will it get? That's the question. Now, there's a very entertaining article in the British newspaper, The Telegraph, this week about a football player in England who really likes the iPad. And um, it's called Me and My iPad, James Haskell. And I guess he's a flanker uh, on a soccer team in England. And he talks about his iPad. And the question is, what do you use your iPad for? And he says, quote, I use it for everything. I'm one of those people who looks at a piece of, of kit and thinks I'm not using it as much as possible, then I'm not fulfilling its potential. So aside from using it for email music, I use it, the camera and I use it for movies a lot. Obviously, the Apple apps are a big part of it. Wh whatever the page, whether that's pages for writing blogs when I'm on the go, or mail simply for organizing most of li my life. So he's obviously a very big iPad user. Another question is, do you use any apps that you don't, you think don't get the publicity they deserve? And he says, aside from mail, which is a bit of an unsung hero for me, I really like Asafora HD. It's fantastic Twitter app, and I think the best presented around but not a lot of people know about it now i've never heard of that uh, he's talking about an app called osephora hd that's o s f o r a h d so look even a, a, a football player in england can be an ipad pundit and come up with interesting stuff um the final question they have is, is there anything that disappoints you about technology? He says, I think people quite often download apps and think they're going to make you a genius. I downloaded Electribe, for instance, and I haven't become a genius on drum synthesizers yet. But I don't think you can legislate for that, even if a better manual wouldn't go amiss. Huh. So I, he's got a point there. I mean, you can download apps. It's not going to magically make you a genius, but, you know, it does give you the ability to learn stuff. Now, one of the things I've always wanted to do with my iPad is mount them on the back of my car's headrest so that the kids could see the iPad, uh, sort of like those built-in DVD players. And um, recently I saw something very cool on a website called gottabemobile.com, and they reviewed... Uh, something that looks very interesting. It's called Vogel's Ringo iPad 2 mounting system, which allows you to, quote, put your iPad anywhere with special case that has a round hole in the back to fit various Ringo mounting solutions. So it sounds like it's a solution to um, mount this in your car. And they have a little bit of a video where you can watch I guess how it um, works and um, it looks it looks a, look a little bulky you've got to put um, this big bracket like around your headrest in your car but um, 
on the other hand, you have to do something so you can dock your iPad. You know, I was, I was, you know, one thing you could do is just get Velcro on both sides and put a sticky part on your iPad and then stick it to the back of your car. But this thing looks much more solid. It looks like there's actually something that snaps into place along the two columns that are your headrest. So, anyways, check it out. It's called Vogel, Vogel's Ringo Mounting System for iPad. There's also a video that shows like a kid using um, the Vogel uh, mounting system here. Let's see what it looks like. What I don't have is a price on um, on this. I'm sure it's not cheap. Um, but if it is a decent solution, it's still going to be a lot cheaper than, you know, putting DVD players, build, building them into your car. When you buy a car, they charge a fortune for these DVD players. And you might as well just get an iPad and some sort of mounting system like this. Now, one thing we've been talking about in the past is how the iPad is being used more and more in enterprise in the work situation. Well, that trend is continuing. There's an interesting story in a website called healthcareitnews.com. The title is iPad 2, a boon to Wheel Cornell Medical College students. Now, Wheel Cornell Medical College is a very prestigious medical college in New York City. And the article says that first and second year students at Wheel Cornell Medical College are being provided with new iPads, which will be synced with EMRs for training during their clerkship. It's going on to say that the iPad 2 will serve to replace students' printed course materials and text, allowing them to download course material, see video or hear audio recordings of lectures, submit electronic course evaluations, access their grades, and collaborate with other students. Um, so this is pretty big news because this is a very prestigious uh, teaching hospital uh, and medical college. Uh, here's some interesting quotes. One person says, um, with an iPad, it will be easy to keep personal and patient records updated, personnel and, and patient records updated in real time as you're meeting with patients, checking reference information, and even looking up body scan images on the fly while making rounds. End quote, says Wheel Cornell student Vinay Patel, who is part of a pilot group that tested the device during the spring of 2001. So this is this is really interesting trend. I mean, we, we've seen pilots using them in the cockpit. We've seen car dealerships using them in the field when trying to make a sale. And now we're seeing medical school students use them. So it's a pretty exciting trend. Now, how are iPads getting into the workplace? Well, VentureBeat.com had a very good article about that entitled How Employees Are Driving an iPad Revolution and What IT's Doing About It. And this was on September 15th, 2001 on VentureBeat.com. Um, and basically, it says that you, users, employee, it's being employee driven. In other words, employees are going to work, bringing their iPads to work and sort of forcing the IT departments to adapt fast. Um, here is an interesting quote. Uh, when the iPad was first released, we didn't have any kind of enterprise strategy about supporting the device, said Jeff Niblack, an IT manager at United Health Group, a diversified health and well-being company with over 80,000 employees worldwide, the article says. The article says, quote, within two weeks, we started getting our first inquiries. In the following two months, though, things really exploded, and I started getting re requests for pulling iPads into nearly all aspects of the enterprise. There are now around 1,100 iPads deployed, end quote. So, you know, this enterprise place was willing to, I guess, accommodate its employees. Um, the article goes on to say a similar thing happened at a company called Kaplan Higher Education. They do those preparatory courses uh, for for passing exams. And um, here's a quote from a representative from Kaplan who says, quote, 
Kaplan has a very young executive team and they were just in love with the iPad, end quote. A Kaplan representative said, quote, they just started buying them and so we had to learn to integrate the iPad as quickly as possible, end quote. So, you mean, if you want it at work, if you want it at work, I suggest that you convince, you bring your iPad to work, show it to your coworkers, and then have your coworkers complain to the IT department that it's not supported, that it doesn't integrate with the email and the and the other you know services that are there. Um, so this is a you know this article sort of confirms what I thought, um, which is that IT departments are only going to be adopting the iPad if the users start to use it first and bring it to work. So according to another site, uh, the military, the United States military, is starting to use iPads. There's a site called the stir.cafemom.com technology um, and somebody is writing about how part of the military is using the iPad. The article is entitled Military Buys iPads in the Hopes They'll Help With This. Uh, and the person writes, when I don't have my iPad during my daily commute to the office I feel like missing my right arm. This is written by Emily Ab Abadie. But for members of the Marines, having an iPad around could actually be the difference between life and death. And she goes on to say, the third aircraft wing of the M Marines recently bought 32 iPads, hoping they'll make their operations more organized and simpler. And um, so she's got a link to this story. Let's go to it. It's in Wired.com. And it's basically about how the Marines are using uh, the iPad. And... Um, you know, it's it's only 32 iPad, um, but you know it could make a difference. And basically, um, there's a captain in the Marine Light Attack Helicopter Squadron who is responsible for piquing the interest of his higher ups. And apparently, he was annoyed with the current communication system, so he decided to mess around with his personal iPad, which he discovered could be digitally linked to troops on the ground. So he was sort of responsible for bringing in the iPad. Uh, and instead of carrying around all the maps, uh, he was able to put them into the iPad. Um, huh. So initially the article says that the, um, the upper brass uh, were a little where you know concerned about what the pilots were doing with the iPads. The um, the article in Wired says they weren't sure if a commercial product was secure enough to handle in combat transmissions. Uh, but then it goes on to say, but about a year later, the brass appears to be on board, uh, and the commanding officer of the HMLA 267 told Defense News that iPads have sped up communications by about 15 minutes during close air missions. So we are seeing it in the military. I mean, I think the it's sort of like a mushrooming effect. The more people use the iPad, the more people use the iPad at work, the more people see how relevant it is and what it can do. I think a lot of people who've been sort of schooled on traditional computing are thinking, find it very difficult to think of a different paradigm like the iPad, where which is touched base. So, I don't know. We're going to see more stories like that in the future. Okay, let's talk about some iPad apps that are worth mentioning. One app that came out on September 13th, which people should check out, is something called WSJ Live. It's free. And, um, and what it is, it's from the Wall Street Journals. And uh, the Wall Street Journal has its other apps, like the news. Uh, but this one basically brings live news and on-demand videos to, from 2,000 reporters, that's what it says. So the Dow Jones company put it out. And so, you know, it's content delivery from um, the Wall Street Journals, and it looks like it's free. So you should check it out. It's uh, Wall Street Journal WSJ Live by DowJones.com. Another app worth mentioning that has come out on the iPad is something called Luminet. Nance, luminance it's spelled l-u-m-i-n-a-n-c-e and it's only a dollar or 99 cents from a company called subsplash and basically it's a it's a it looks like a pretty high-end ipad 
photo editing app, um, you know, that has like filters and brightness and contrast controls, and you can adjust tone curves. So it, it looks like it's a more involved way to edit photos. And um, I guess it also works on the iPhone too. So, you know, it's got white balance, exposure, brightness, contrast, hue, saturation, tone curves, split toning, vignette, color, sepia. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking for a new photo app, this one seems to be, you know, pretty good and it's only 99 cents. I want to remind everybody, if you haven't checked it already, there is a Skype app for the iPad. It's one of my favorite apps. And uh, it's called Skype for iPad from Skype. And it's a great way to communicate and turn your um, iPad into a phone. If you've got a Skype account, you can actually make calls to landlines and cell phones from your Skype for iPad app. And um, it also um, can send and receive video uh, over the iPad. And... Um, Again, it's free to make calls Skype to Skype. It's definitely going to be something that competes with FaceTime because Skype is everywhere. A lot of people have Skype apps. Another app you should check out if you're into football, NFL football is the official NFL football app from NFL Enterprises called NFL 11 for iPad. And I've been using that app, the iPhone version, for a long time. And there's a free version that has everything from scores to, you know, team inf information. And it's, it's, it's pretty rich. You've got game highlights. You can watch on-demand NFL Network news. You can tap on team logos to see rosters, uh, team stats. You can follow games with drive charts and stats. So it's a pretty, you know, rich app. And it is the official one. Um, the only thing that stinks and people complain about it is that there are ads in it. So some people give it like one star for the ads, but again, it's free. So my view is, look, it's free. I'm not paying anything. So what's a few ads? Now, one of the late breaking pieces of information on this September 18th regarding the iPad is that there might be a reason that some version of the iPad comes out in October that's new. Uh, and this comes from PCMag.com. Now, AT&T has upgraded and released its uh, 4G LTE network service in five cities. They're going to debut very shortly in Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio on, I guess, um, today. Um, now, what is this? This is the faster data service 4G that for, that AT&T is going to roll out. Right now with the iPad you can only get 3G data service on AT&T and 3G data service on uh, Verizon. Well PC Mag points out that uh, AT&T has already launched an iPad specific data plan as part of its LTE rollout called No Commitment iPad Data Connect Plan even though no current iPad supports LTE. And the uh, iPad Data Connect plan costs $14.99 for 250 megabytes of data and 25 bucks for 2 gigabytes. Now, that's the current uh, plan also for the 3G. So, I don't know. Is this a typo? Or maybe Apple is releasing a, uh, a version of the iPad that's really the same as the iPad 2 but has the LTE chips in it. So... Um, I don't know. I think that's quite possible. If I was Apple, I wouldn't revamp and release a true iPad 3. I would just release an iPad 2 that has a 4G chip in it so it can run with the 4G chip that uh, AT&T provides and the 4G chip that Verizon provides. But I wouldn't say that's a whole new iPad 3 unless it has a faster processor which I don't think is going to come in the fall, and uh, like a high definition, uh, higher definition screen. But I do think it's possible that Apple will modify and release a um, 
4G version of the iPad if it can. So we'll have to see. All this is going to happen in the coming weeks. Okay, so that's it for the iPad podcast this week. It's a little shorter. It's about 45 minutes instead of the regular 60 minutes. uh, Because I think, I don't know, there's a little less news this week. Um, Again, this is a chit-chat-free podcast. Thanks for listening. The video version of this podcast, the iPad podcast, can be found on YouTube and also Blip TV and under Apple Things on iTunes. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This has been a Max Future Production.